Hello, hi. Welcome back to our latest chapter in Southampton Reviews in Cardiothoracic Surgery. In this chapter, we'll be discussing cardiac physiology. Before we start, I would like to thank our supervisors for this section, Professor Sonal Ori, our clinical lead, and lead for education, as well as Mr. Zavi Miskolci, our uh, consultant adult cardiac surgeon, and Mr. Suvatish Luthra, our senior surgical fellow. As usual, we'll start with a mind map, table of contents. I must admit, I enjoyed preparing um, um, this chapter a lot. Uh, reason are, um, every single topic in this chapter could be traced back to a clinical practice we see on a daily basis. We do things as second nature, yet we, it's very enjoyable understanding the theoretical basis behind these practices we do on a daily basis. Also, it's full of exam-related topics. By the end of this chapter subset, you should be able to answer a few questions. For instance, um, what is the cellular basis of, um, let's start the video. What is the cellular basis of uh, preload optimization? What is the cellular basis of afterload optimization? And how is contractility affected? by various uh, um, factors. Um, why is the right ventricle uh, more resistant, uh, less resistant to injury than the left ventricle, and so on. Let's start with the basic stuff first. I have a confession to make. Back in med school, I had trouble visualizing how muscle bundles descend down in a hierarchical manner all the way to actinomycin filaments. It has always been difficult to visualize this in my mind. In a simple manner, muscle bundles are formed from multiple fascicles. Each fascicle consists of thousands of myofibrils, which in turn are formed of thousands of branching myofibrils. But where does actin and myosin sit in this hierarchy? If you dissect open a myocyte, you will discover it shows all the common features of a standard human cell with special modifications to suit its function. It consists of a cell membrane denoted by yellow color, numerous mitochondria, red in color, multiple nuclei, violet in color, and cytoplasmic organelles. Actin and myosin filaments are merely cytoplasmic organelles clustered in bundles. Notably, cell membrane shows special invaginations referred to as T-tubules. Also, cytoplasmic reticulum in blue color in here is abundantly surrounded surrounding these actin and myosin bundles. This serves the purpose of bathing the actin and myosin bundles with calcium and other ions essential for their contraction. Both skeletal and cardiac muscles share this arrangement pattern of actin, actin and myosin into bundles in the cytoplasm. Hence, both are referred to as striated muscles. The benefit of this arrangement is it allows the muscle action to be a concise linear direction in concise linear direction, unlike smooth muscle, where the random arrangement of actin myosin permits a flexible pattern of contraction. This, of course, serves the purpose of each. The myocardium, however, exhibits a unique uh, branching nature of the myocytes. They are connected together with specialized areas referred to as intercalated discs. This enables the whole myocardium to act in synchrony, driven by the leading pacemaker controlling all muscle cells simultaneously, which is located in the sinoatrium node. Now let's look into the sarcomere. This was described by the German scientist Antonio van Leeuwenhoek. Sarcomeres extend between uh, uh, two distinct perpendicular discs, referred to as Z-line, that here stands for Zwischenscheibe, or in between disc or separator disc uh, by the German language. The peripheral areas are less uh, crowded and formed only by actin, uh, thin filaments called the I bands. I here stands for isotropic or uniformly oriented. Centrally resides a denser uh, area formed of both actin and myosin filaments intercalated together, hence called A bands. A here stands for anisotropic or non uniformly organized. In the midline lies, uh, lies a, a region of uh, pure myosin filaments referred to as H zone. H here stands for heller or brighter in German language. In the midline lies another distinctive perpendicular disc referred to as M line. M here stands for Mittelscheibe or midline disc in German. A fairly recently discovered elastic protein referred to as the Titan, or in Greek, this stands for the giant thing, traverses the length of the sarcomere, can, as you can see here, from uh, Z, Z lines to M lines, all the way to here, and behaves like a spring structure inside the muscle cell. 
accounting for the slingshot-like action of the sarcomere. It, it, it rebounds. It has only been discovered in the early 80s. It is interesting to know that the titan proteins are considered the longest known proteins in terms of the amount of uh, amino acid sequences. The reason why we are emphasizing on it, it will serve a purpose later on during the, uh, the chapter uh, by understanding how preload optimization happens. Um, next, let's have a look at, um, um, uh, let's plunge further into the ultrastructure of the actin and myosin. We'll find a unique interaction uh, referred to as the cross bridge cycle, essentially. It uh, refers to, um, essentially, it all starts with binding of calcium troponin C. This induces transformational changes to the overlying tropomycin and exposing actin binding site. And in the meanwhile, heads, the myosin heads get primed by ATP to enable the binding as well. Once actin and myosin uh, um, uh, bind to each other, this releases the ATP and creates the, the swinging movement or the... the um, um, uh, the stroke phase of the cross bridge cycle bringing about the sliding of actin filaments uh, on top of mycin then uh, uh, unbinding occurs and the cycle restarts again let's have a look at it again as you can see transformational changes and then the stroke phase. <clears throat> now let's look at preload optimization. Filling or giving volume leads to an increase in contractility within limits. This was demonstrated clearly in the frank starling curve. We all know it. We will discuss this in more details later in this chapter. For now, we'll focus on the mechanism of this at a cellular level and from a structural point of view. Essentially, two main mechanisms are in effect. In effect. First, Filling stretches the sarcomere, bringing more actin and myosin in contact, hence increasing the number of cross-bridge cycles, which can be achieved at a given level of calcium and ATP. This is referred to as active tension. Please remember, overlapping areas of actin do not create cross-bridge cycles, simply because actin and myosin have polarity. Only the ipsilateral filaments can interact. Overlapping contralateral fil filaments will block the binding process. Look. As you can see here, the overlap has been removed. This brings these actin against uh, these myosin, sorry, against these actin and allows more cross bridge cycles. Beforehand, these were blocked by the contralateral side uh, actin filaments. Second is stretching of the titan. As you can see here, filling stretches the titan to its extent and this creates a slingshot um, action which increases the force of the uh, contraction by these two mechanisms preload optimization brings the uh, muscle or the sarcomere at its uh, most efficient state where it can produce the maximum contraction let me bring that back Let's have a look at it again. So the overlapping is abolished when you fill. And second, filling stretches the titan more, uh, which behaves as a slingshot. Um, the more it stretches, the more powerful the recoil becomes. This is referred to as passive tension. It is worth mentioning here that in systolic heart failure, one of the mechanisms in failure uh, to produce and utilize calcium and ATP effectively to generate enough active tension where as in the diastolic heart failure or half puff as the cardiologists call it heart failure with preserved ejection fraction one of the postulated mechanism is failure of the muscle to relax enough to generate passive tension so mechanism one and two are uh, respectively in systolic and uh, diastolic heart failure uh, let's look at afterload optimization. In a comparative manner, afterload optimization can be rationalized using a curve similar to Frank Starling curve. Maybe not as famous, but equally important. It is the force velocity curve. This was described by Edmund Sonnenblick. 
1962. He concluded that the higher the afterload, the slower the muscle contracts. We all experience this in our daily activities. The heavier the object uh, uh, we lift, the slower our muscle contracts. Essentially, the more resistance the myocardium faces, the more difficult it becomes for acting to slide over uh, uh, myosin and uh, uh, it becomes more uh, difficult to achieve um, um, shortening. This, uh, at a certain point, the afterload becomes maximum, and at this point, there is no shortening at all, and this is called Fmax. Now, let's look at contractility optimization. Understanding the cross uh, cycle enables you to understand various mechanisms of positive and negative inotropes. Positive inotropes essentially exhibit three main effects. One, increasing intracellular calcium, either by increasing adenylate cyclate activities, such as catecholamines and their deriv derivatives, such as adrenaline, noradrenaline, dopamine, or reducing adenylate hydrolase activities, such as bipyridine der derivatives, such as melanone or amrinone. The second mechanism is increasing troponin affinity to calcium by reducing its binding coefficient, such as levosamandin and theophylline. Three, increasing myosin heavy chains, such as the thyroxine. In negative ionotropy, on the other hand, there are three other mechanisms, for instance, decreasing intracellular calcium by either decreasing adenylate cyclase activity, such as beta blockers, or directly inhibiting calcium uptake, such as calcium channel blockers. Two, reducing troponin C to calcium binding affinity, such as all volatile anesthetic gases. Three, affecting energy expenditure, such as sepsis, hypoxia, and um, acidosis. Um, finally, we would discuss the uh, intercalated discs. One of the postulated mechanisms or postulated reasons why the RV is, uh, is um, more vulnerable than the LV is a less number of myocytes leading to less number of intercalated discs, which maintains not only electrical coupling, but mechanical uh, coupling as well. I think the demonstration video here explains it all. So as you can see here, all um, myocytes are connected together via specialized uh, connection points called the intercalated discs. These um, uh, discs have both mechanical coupling area denoted by the orange color in here as you can see that is referred to as the macular adherence or the dismal form there is also the fascia adherence that is the black part in here as you can see it's also contributes to the mechanical stability there are uh, however electrical specialized point called gap junctions these ensure that the electrical uh, impulse can pass um, almost simultaneously between all myocytes these two functions of intercalated discs maintain both the electrical and mechanical integrity of the myocyte one of the postulated mechanisms why RV is uh, l less resistance to injury than the uh, left ventricle is the less number of intercalated discs, less muscle si myocytes, less intercalated discs, and hence integrity is maintained together with less number of uh, protective uh, discs. Um, this concludes uh, this chapter. I hope I managed to um, um, introduce you to some of the no, uh, no, um, theoretical basis of uh, our day-to-day -day activities and uh, hopefully this uh, chapter will also enable you to answer a few of the MCQ questions which come now and then um, every now and then in the exams. Um, finally, hopefully we'll meet in the next chapter and uh, thank you very much.